let's talk about road rage. If you have your license, maybe you've experienced it personally. You've probably been in the car with someone who has raged while driving. Or maybe you've been in a car with someone and another driver was raging at you. Maybe you've never experienced road rage, but you've encountered hallway rage. I just made that term up. Hallway rage would be when you bumped into someone between classes and they dropped their phone. And then they get really mad and frustrated at you. Or maybe you remember a time when someone cut in front of you in the lunch line and you told them off. On the road or in the hallway, we all know that kind of rage. Even if you don't yell at someone or act rude with someone at school, you probably know the feeling of that kind of rage inside of you. You may not call it rage and you may not call it anger, but you get the idea. Maybe you'd say that you're frustrated. When your sister shrinks your favorite shirt in the wash, you are mad, you're frustrated. When your stepdad grounds you for the weekend, you aren't angry, you're frustrated. Why? Because we don't like to think of ourselves as having an anger problem. But let's be honest, is there a difference between being mad and being frustrated? I mean, is there really a difference between road rage and road frustration? We're in this series called Vibes, and we're talking about the emotions and feelings we experience and how to name them for what they are. But we're also talking about keeping those vibes from controlling us. And it all starts by figuring out what's going on inside of us, because that's where our emotions come from. And one of the emotions that definitely shows up from inside of us is anger. The thing about anger is it doesn't always look the same. Sometimes it means yelling at someone or losing your temper. That's how we normally think of it. But sometimes it means giving someone the silent treatment. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes when someone is mad at you and they're not saying a word, it's way worse. In fact, maybe you're really good at giving people the silent treatment. Not only is it a way for you to process your anger, it's a way for you to control the situation. You hold the power because you withhold the words. Even more complicated, not all anger is bad. There's the anger we feel when we see injustices, when we see things like certain groups of people being treated unfairly, causes that we care about not being taken seriously, racism, people who don't have clean water, or people who don't take care of the planet. When we see these things happening in the world that aren't right, it's a good thing to get angry. So sometimes anger is helpful, and other times it's destructive. Either way, it's a powerful emotion. So what can we possibly do to get this vibe under control? We're going to look at a passage from the book of James in the New Testament. James was the brother of Jesus, but when Jesus was alive and walked the earth, James didn't follow him. It was only after Jesus was crucified and came back to life that James was convinced. Eventually, James became a leader in the early church. He lived in Jerusalem, and he wrote a letter primarily to Jewish Christians. It's a letter full of wisdom. And in that section we're going to look at today, James offers a principle that may sound a little too simple at first. But hang in there, because if you and I can learn to do this, it'll change everything. James starts by saying this, who is wise in an understanding among you? We hear the word wise a lot, but we may not really focus on what it means. Wise is different from smart. You can be born smart, but wisdom is earned. If you're wise, you take what you've experienced and learn from it. You understand that life is connected and that actions have consequences. And James is saying, this is important and I wanna make sure you get it because here's what's next. He continues, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So James is making a connection here. He's saying that wise people are humble, and what does humility look like? It starts with a proper view of yourself, where you don't see yourself as the exception to the rules. You don't think the world revolves around you and your desires. You don't think that you deserve better treatment than everyone else. You don't see everyone else as a means to an end for what you want. James is saying that wise people don't do these things. He continues, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Harbor basically means to let something stick around. If you let stuff stay with you that makes you think you're better or more important, don't deny it. Call it out. Don't pretend to be fine. And then James says this, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Let's say it a different way. When pride or arrogance gets lodged inside of us, it comes out in our actions. Not exactly great news, but he doesn't leave us hanging. A couple verses later, he asks, what causes fights and quarrels among you? 
I bet I could stop right there and everyone would have an answer to that question. Parents with unrealistic rules, younger siblings that won't stop being annoying, friends that don't text back, a stepdad that acts like he's always right, people with obnoxious TikTok accounts. We all have an answer outside of us that causes the problems among us, but James isn't buying it. He answers his own question by saying, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? In other words, your mom may drive you crazy and your little brother may be annoying, but what causes the arguments? It's not them, it's you. Or more specifically, what's in you? And this is a big deal, because as long as we think the problem is someone else, their behavior, their character, their mistake, we'll never deal with the anger problem that's inside of us. We think the problem is people not doing things our way. But James is saying the problem is that we want to get our way. But as long as we think the problem is outside of us, we'll never take care of what's inside of us. You may disagree, because maybe you feel like the things you want are things that have to be earned. Things like freedom, respect, trust, and responsibility. And when you don't get the things that you feel like you've earned, it doesn't seem fair. And you're right. But James isn't talking about what's fair and what isn't. He's saying that if you want to get to the root of your frustration and anger, you need to be willing to admit that the problem is in you. The problem is when you don't get what you think you deserve. So what do we do? Well, we have to change the scripts. When other people aren't acting like we think they should, or we aren't getting what we want or think we deserve, we have to change what we say. Instead of saying, he's being selfish, she's being annoying, or they're being rude. Instead, we say, you know what the problem is? I'm not getting what I want. I understand that this sounds terrible, but I'm telling you, when you start doing this, your relationships will change. Your frustration level changes. Your anger changes. Why? Because you're no longer looking to other people as a reason for why you feel the way you feel. As long as you're looking to other people as the reason for feeling the way you do, other people have control of your emotions. On the other hand, when you start admitting that the problem is that you're not getting what you want, you get control back. And isn't that what we all want when it comes to our emotions? We want control. James is making the point that as long as you think the problem is outside of yourself and that it's somebody else's fault, you'll feel like you get a free pass to act however you want because you can say that you didn't do anything wrong. You can avoid ownership and responsibility. You can look at others and say, they made me do it. They made me act that way. They made me say it. They left me no choice. But James is saying, nope. If you did that thing or said that thing that was angry, mean, or hurtful, it was because it was in you to say it or do it. Of course, there are circumstances that should upset you, like being treated unfairly. But imagine if in the middle of feeling your anger and frustration, you were able to say part of the problem, not the whole problem, but part of it, is that I'm not getting what I want. Just being willing to say that out loud helps you keep yourself from being controlled by anger and frustration. Owning your part of the problem keeps your anger and frustration from driving you and owning you. And no matter who you are, that's a good thing. Based on what we've talked about today, here's my question for you. What's your relationship with anger? Do you control it or does it control you? If I were to ask your coach, your mom or dad, step parents, brother and sister, teammates, classmates, friends, what would they say? Because if your anger is controlling you in any of these relationships, then it's controlling you too much. And the only way to beat it, according to James, is with humility. And humility says, it's not all my fault, but I'm going to own my part of it. And my part of it has to do with me not getting my way when I want to. So when you feel anger, frustration, or whatever you wanna call it rising up, when you're in that disagreement with a parent, step-parent, coach, friend, or sibling, ask yourself, what am I not getting that is causing this anger? Because even if you aren't the whole problem, humility means recognizing that you're part of the problem. And when you learn how to recognize that, the emotion of anger begins to lessen its control over you. The good news is that for those of us who are Jesus followers, we follow someone who has led the way in this. Jesus said no to getting his way. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote about this very thing when he talked about Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus had every reason and every right to get his own way, but he didn't. He gave up what he wanted so that we could know how valuable we are in God's sight. Paul starts this passage about Jesus and his humility by saying this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love. Did you catch that? He tells us to be like Christ, and then he tells us what Christ is like. Humble, when he had every reason not to be. Jesus surrendered his way when he could have easily fought for it. Following the example of Jesus is how we keep anger from controlling us. Think of it this way. Because of Jesus, anger doesn't have to be the boss of you. I really believe following Jesus will make your life better. I really do. Because when you follow him, he will nudge you away from self-centeredness, arrogance, and pride, and move you more towards humility and love for others. And as that happens, you will find that anger no longer has the hold on you that it did before. And less powerful anger is a win for everyone. This week, I want you to begin imagining what life would look like if anger didn't control you. None of us will get this right completely or all the time, but I want to encourage you to talk to someone this week. Maybe it's your pastor or maybe it's your small group, but talk about some ways that you can take some steps in the right direction. In your personal circumstances, what would it look like for you to choose wisdom and humility over anger? When you're no longer controlled by anger and you choose to show humility and love, it can change everything.